I'm joined this afternoon by the research manager and lead economist in the human development team of the World Bank's development research group. Her new book, Accelerating Poverty Reduction in Africa, was published by the World Bank Group. Dr. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you, Tita. It's very nice to be here. Wonderful. I'm very much excited to have you. I understand that you co-authored this report together with uh, Luke Christensen, who is uh, a senior economist in the Office of the Chief Economist for the Africa region of the World Bank. And you also had several other contributors from various departments within the World Bank and other external academics from different institutions. I would like you to take me through the core ideas of this report. But before we get to do that, can you just uh, briefly describe the work that you do with the World Bank as research manager and lead economist in the human development team? Great. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my current position. Uh, I am now a research manager in the bank's research group. Uh, I am the manager for our human development team. We are a group of uh, economists in this case doing applied uh, economics work, looking at a number of questions around uh, improving human development outcomes and utilizing human development in uh, primarily in low and middle income countries. As a manager, I support the researchers in my team who lead their own research agendas. But as an individual researcher, I also have my own research agenda focused mainly on labor uh, and gender. Um, prior to being a research manager, though, I had left the research group for a number of years to work on the operational side of the bank, uh, as well as in our Africa Chief Economist Office. So. Uh, trying to infuse knowledge and analytics uh, throughout the bank, uh, not just from the research group side of the institution. So now looking at that, uh, looking at that experience that you have had serving as a research manager and lead economist, how has it helped you understand more issues around poverty and the global economy? You know, the, the research group in the bank is centered around the, uh, the objective of bringing uh, high quality analytical work uh, knowledge production to inform the bank's work and uh, and to bring knowledge into the development space in general. So in the research group, we recruit people who are mainly focused on development challenges uh, and studying these questions both at a global level, at a regional level, and within country. Uh, so our day-to-day -day work is all about understanding development and asking very difficult questions trying to find good data, trying to collect better data to bring evidence to policymaking in the, in the development space. And I've been looking at your CV and I, I was much more fascinated by uh, the policy research uh, working paper on poverty, gender and household composition. Many people still do not understand up to today that the impact of poverty varies across intersectionality. And this has created so many problems for policymakers and even government and so forth. But now coming to the report, to the report on accelerating poverty reduction in Africa, what would you say are the major observations, the major findings of the report and the key recommendations that you make? The report focuses on Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that's a very important distinction to make because while the title says Africa, which is sort of the... Um, the World Bank's uh, label for the Sub-Saharan region, uh, as well as other development partners, um, we are not looking, and so we are not looking at the Northern African countries, which have very different economies and political economy and demographic issues uh, at play. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to comment about the report is um, it's an enormous topic. I mean, we really struggled to think about how would we tackle this this incredibly large question. And so while I, I'm, I'm very proud of the work we did on the report and the various uh, issues we address and the empirical evidence we bring, there are certainly like many facets of poverty that this report does not cover. Uh, and thirdly, the Sub-Saharan region uh, is comprised of uh, 48, for us, we, call, we count 48 countries that have very diverse situations. So our, what I will describe to you for our main findings will vary by country and they'll vary a lot. So this is not a prescription for, you know, for Zimbabwe or for Ghana or for Malawi. 
Um, but it's a framework for thinking about what are the big issues in the region and for helping kind of prioritize some of the policy agenda potentially in the countries that we work with. Uh, so with those caveats, um, I think the way we frame the main messages of the report, uh, which is you know quite long and, and in depth, but we did distill, I think, four main themes or areas of focus that we found to be really critical if we're going to take seriously the agenda of accelerating poverty reduction. Um, and let me add a, another caveat. This was all pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. So I don't think these lessons will have changed in light of COVID, but you know, COVID has had distinct impacts on a number of countries that, that might change some of the sub, sub parts of these messages. So what are the messages? Um, we identified four uh, priority areas that need focus and attention for the countries struggling the most with reducing poverty. The first is uh, population growth rates. This is particularly relevant for very high fertility countries that have total fertility rates you know, well above four and have stagnant declining fertility. And I can talk more about why high population growth, it, why it poses a challenge for poverty reduction. The second is the message around food production and particularly the productivity of smallholder farmers. Uh, in most countries in the region, uh, the largest share of the working population and certainly the largest share of the poor are in smallholder farming. And we have to take seriously the productivity challenges that they face growing food and cash crops to uh, reduce poverty in the region. The third theme focus is on fragility. And by fragility, fragility, we really mean uh, conflict and um, and a range of risk that households face. Uh, conflict is one of them, but also health and environmental risk that make people's incomes uh, uh, prone to be affected by shocks. And these shocks push people into poverty and keep them from pulling themselves out of poverty through their income um, their income activities. And then the fourth area that we focus on is what we call fiscal, the fiscal space. And this is really like the question of where is government spending money and how is government spending money? Mm -hmm. It's a question of allocating to certain sectors. Do they spend, uh, how are the shares being spent on education, health, social protection, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. It's also a question of what we call sub-sector spending. So within education, how much is going to primary? How much is going to tertiary? And the efficiency of that spending has to be a conversation we, we should have. And that was especially true when we wrote this report because a number of countries were in increasing debt distress levels. It's probably more true today because that debt distress problem has not gone away with the global pandemic. What, what were your sources? How do you come up with uh, the information that you use to profile poverty? for different countries or for the region itself at large. I'm asking this primarily because there is contention around this of the reports that come out of multilateral organizations that sometimes they don't portray the actual picture that's right on the ground. Thank you for that question, uh, because that, that's really quite important. That profile of poverty uh, in, really is the starting point for us thinking about how to tackle the problem. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm a real data nerd. So uh, I take seriously the question about data sources and the evidence base. Uh, for profiling poverty in these countries, we're use, using data from national statistical offices. Um, sometimes these are household surveys that um, myself or other colleagues have directly worked with the national statistical agencies on collecting. And other times, we complement that data with additional, uh, pr primarily household data that measures uh, deprivation in terms of consumption, um, infrastructure in the household, water, sanitation, children attending school, children getting health services, and the like. Uh, these are large household surveys, and they're designed to, to let you look at these intersectionalities. So uh, rural, urban, different types of income sources for households, uh, different age profiles of households um, and the like. Uh, and, and the quality of that data is really critical for building a robust profile. In fact, when we started this work, we actually decided we needed a whole separate report that just looked at the quality of the data. 
And so this report that we're talking about today, Accelerating Poverty Reduction in Africa, was following another report where we looked very carefully at the quality of the data from the region and, and identified where we had a lot of serious concerns. So if anyone wants to read a second book on poverty in Africa about the data sources, I can point you to that, to that production, that publication. How do you bypass the bias that, that gets to come out as a result of consulting national statistical agencies? Because the tendency of most governments is to uh, portray the picture that all is well, or that uh, we are performing better. Our unemployment is very low. Inflation is not as skyrocketing as you might think. How do you then uh, bypass that bias to try and get probably an objective picture that is not only consultative of national statistical agencies, but other sources? Well, I appreciate your skepticism and concern there, and it's one that I share. Uh, and I think there are a number of ways that we do this. Uh, the first is the, the World Bank um, embraces an open data agenda. So even our uh, technical and financial support to national statistical agencies is conditional on making the microdata publicly available to, to, to users, um, not just available within the statistical agency or within the government. Um, second is we spend a lot of time on the ground working with counterparts in the national statistical agencies. This includes, you know, I mean, I myself, I've worked in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia. I mean, I can list other countries and we really get boots on the ground to look at what is happening when data are being collected and how data are being processed. And I have to say, I, in general, in my experience, there's not, I don't see interference at that level because it's a kind of a technocratic um, activity. Uh, you're getting statisticians on the ground. I think where one has to be really concerned about um, misrepresenting or showing biased statistics is in analyzing the data. Uh -huh. And there it's very important that both the data are made publicly available and the definitions and the analysis uh, programming, if you will, of data files are made publicly available so that they can be scrutinized. It, uh -huh. I, I, you know, it, it, there are ways to manipulate how one comes up with a, any particular indicator, be it unemployment or poverty, and we have to be very aware of, of what decisions are being made in analyzing data, because all of these measures are not usually a simple yes, no question on a survey. Mm -hmm. They're a co you're combining various parts of the questionnaire, you're applying a price index, you're applying sampling weights, and all of those open, open up a lot of decisions that have to be made along the way. Now, the third uh, place I think we can come in and um, bring robustness checks to our work is through looking at additional data sources that were not under the uh, purview or the control of the NSO, the statistics agency. In many of these countries, if not most, you have private entities and universities who collect their own surveys separate from the statistics agency. And in, in the best case scenario, we can look at the data coming from the statistics agency uh, and compare those indicators with what come from surveys done by academics or think tanks in the same country. And then we have, uh, we're able to actually identify potentially sources of bias that might be coming from either source. And it's very important to do that. It, it, it lends credibility to any of the numbers that we come out with. Um, but even getting that kind of data is a challenge because I would say the countries where one might be most concerned about the quality of data, might also be the same countries where think tanks and universities are less likely to be collecting data because of the, uh, the same hurdles uh, that generate bias data, maybe the ones that discourage private collection of surveys. Based on your experiences uh, gathering information and trying to solicit for insights, what would you consider to be the most difficult and challenging uh, problem in terms of getting this information? A lot of countries don't have recent census data mm -hmm. and population census data is critical for the sample frame. You know, to, do, to conduct a good survey, you have to um, 
select sample households in a very robust way. So that's a big problem in a number of countries. They do not have recent census. That also makes it difficult to compute sample weights because we want a number that's representative of entire you know, regions or uh, sub-districts, if you will, and you need sample weights and they come from the census data. And satellite data, geo-reference data, uh, will not help replace, I think, the census data on the population side. That's one issue. Um, another challenge is that statistics agencies are perpetually underfunded. They're under-resourced. Within governments, uh, I think there's a sense that they're lower priority, maybe because some governments aren't sure they want to produce a lot of data because it will call, you know, it is a way of monitoring living standards and um, may leave them vulnerable to criticism. Mm -hmm. um, third is capacity can be low in some countries. Uh, the resources to fund surveys, um, the lack thereof mm -hmm. also translates into a lack of support to the capacity of statistical agencies and in investing in the skills of statisticians. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, some dimensions of poverty don't lend themselves well to a quantitative household survey. Um, if we care about things like mental well being or um, women's exposure to violence, um, these are concepts that can be very hard to collect in a household survey. So, even when we do a great survey that's well resourced with really um, skilled statisticians, um, we are limited in kind of the, gr the grand scheme and what we can say about poverty by. The complex nature of the concept. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for this. Viewers and listeners, this was Dr. Caitlin Beagle. Uh, she is the research manager and lead economist in the human development team of the World Bank's Development Research Group. Her new book, Accelerating Poverty Reduction in Africa, was published by the World Bank Group. And a copy of this book can be accessed on the link that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video and in the comment sections on our Facebook page. Dr. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for the invitation. That is wonderful. Have a good day. You too, thanks.